Okay, we are on. I apologize for the delay. I had to check our radar, uh, see what our weather rain situation was going to be. Uh, but I wanted to get started. Um, I'm going to apologize. Uh, some of the, the audio is a little lower in volume and some of the recorded components. Um, so you may want to make sure it's quiet around and um, turn your volume up when we get to that. Um, <clears throat> it will be, again, on the student portal, everything will be adjusted up uh, so that you can hear everything a little bit better there. Um, so with that being said, we'll dive right in here to tonight, uh, lecture number six in our Haynes Method Hybrid DN certification. We're talking about the advanced thoracic piece. Uh, I would like to tell you that this one will be a little bit quicker, and it might be, but it depends on how many squirrels I chase, quite honestly. So let's dive right in and see where we are. All right, first off, uh, we'll look at um, our uh, posterior scapular thoracic region. Here we'll look at uh, the upper, middle, and the lower traps. We'll move more medially uh, to the levator scap. We'll look at the rhomboids major and minor, serratus posterior superior, uh, the serratus anterior, the latissimus, multivitus, and the rotatories, and then spinalis, longissimus, iliocostalis, and thoracic interspinalis. Moving to the anterior torso, here we'll look at pec major, minor, the subclavius, and then the rectus abdominis, the transversus abdominis, external and internal obliques. Then we'll move into some tendons and ligaments. We'll look at the radiant sternocostal ligaments, the costal cartilage, the anterior uh, sternoclavicular joint ligament, the linea alba, and the inguinal ligament. Finally, we'll jump into our regional diagnosis protocols. Here we'll look at the, the CT junction, uh, the um, scapulothoracic junction, the thoracolumbar junction, and then thoracic spine in general, and then thoracic outlet syndrome. And then perineural protocols, we'll look at our supraclavicular nerves. So we'll look at some supporting evidence. Uh, this um, uh, study that came out from uh, Valera and Calero, um, it's the prediction model of rhomboid major and pleura depth based on anthropometric features to decrease the risk of pneumothorax during dry needling. And so on this, um, their objective was to investigate if this anthropometric feature could predict the rhomboid major muscle in the pleura depth in a sample of healthy subjects to avoid risk of pneumothorax during dry needling. So the net result here, they wanted to see if they could determine what a safe depth when needling in that thoracic region would be. Uh, they looked at uh, 59 healthy subjects um, with a total of 236 measurements. And they did this using um, uh, ultrasonography uh, to see the, the depth. Uh, and so the conclusion, uh, well, let's see, down low. In general, inserting a maximum length of 19 millimeters is recommended to reach uh, the deep limit of the rhomboid major, decreasing the risk of passing through the pleura. We're going to see in a, as we, when we get to the rhomboids, uh, the, the approach that I've adopted uh, is a little bit uh, less uh, specific in that depth because we're going to take a sharp oblique angle to needle into rhomboid major and minor onto uh, the, the medial border of the scapula. Um, here what their conclusion uh, identified that gender, BMI, and thorax circumference can predict both rhomboid and pleura depth uh, and as it was assessed with their ultrasonography in their healthy subjects. And their findings could assist clinicians in the needle length election in avoiding the risk of induced pneumothorax during dry needling. And I propose that a better solution instead of trying to determine if you've got a proper depth uh, going completely posterior to anterior is again, take this oblique um, angle uh, towards through, through the rhomboids towards uh, their attachment onto the scapula itself. Okay, then let's look at our clinical decision-making. So in the advanced cervical for our um, 
our 3KS uh, for cervical and in here now the thoracic. For the cervical, we just looked at the cervical linear motion, the cervical diagonal rotation and trunk rotation. And then to include the thoracic component, now we're actually going to, so that we get that, that, that linear and that diagonal motion, that three-dimensional motion of the thoracic spine, we're going to include some lumbar uh, linear and diagonal rotation. here. So this is just a repeat of what we saw in the advanced cervical course or the lecture, uh, just a linear motion through the cervical spine. You can see as I'm doing this, I am carrying my left shoulder a little bit higher. That's a habitual problem that I have. Uh, my movements are a little choppy uh, going from uh, in the diagonal plane. Uh, in this I was having when recorded some pain in the in the right or in my left screen right um, levator scap region as I go through those motions. So we looked at it from the frontal view. Then we'll look at uh, our trunk rotation. Again, fairly stiff as I start out, and I'm pushing towards my end range with each repetitive movement. Symmetry is I've got a little bit better rotation moving in that motion around to the left than I did to the right. Then here from a side view, again, motion is not terrible. Uh, I could have a little bit better cervical extension. Uh, I do have some degenerative pathology in my cervical spine. And so that makes a little bit of sense about some of that limitation. Again, in this motion, uh, a little bit choppy with the movements. And I'll be the first to admit that uh, my neck is not my greatest feature uh, because of the degenerative pathology that I have. Uh, with both of these movements, uh, rotation from the right and from the left, again, on that left side, I was experiencing some discomfort a little bit uh, right beside the neck in the uh, levator scap region. Again, for my rotation, a little stiffness. Asymmetry is not terribly bad. There's nothing, uh, nothing grossly uh, out of sorts there. Um, motion a little bit better going to the left than to the right. And then here, let's, let's take a look at the lumbar linear motion. Um, this is, there was no warm up, there was no prep. Uh, just simply, we're gonna start by reaching down touching the toes, and then we're going to reach up tall and, and extend the back, leaning back uh, to uh, get a full flexion to extension movement. We're going to repeat five repetitions. Again, you'll note, if you can tell, I'm carrying that left shoulder a little bit higher. Uh, partly that's due to a uh, clavicular fracture and plating and screws that happened. And so on our diagonal rotation, so we're going to, let's, let me get that out of the way, see if I can back up a little bit. So we're going to reach with, in this case, we're starting with the right hand, going to reach down towards the left toe. And then we're going to add that rotational, uh, that three-dimensional uh, component by then reaching across the body with the, with the left hand to reach across and over above. And so that gives us a three-dimensional movement in the thoracic lumbar spine as well. But uh, our objective here uh, for this lecture is to see what's happening in the thoracic. You get a decent amount of rotation there, and then we'll, we'll reverse that. And as I warm a little bit, you'll note that I get a little bit more of that motion to the left as I'm moving through these. So that being said, that would probably indicate that I have a little bit more issue of limitation on the right again. As we look at my, my shoulders, definitely carrying left shoulder a little bit higher, uh, carrying my right arm uh, further away from the body. And so I'm either carrying the, the left elevated or I'm carrying the right depressed uh, because I know what happened with my left um, 
so clavicular fracture tried to heal on its own it wouldn't so uh the the clavicle pieces um crossed over about an inch and it was held that way for a couple of weeks until i went to have uh, more imaging had surgery they separated it out so the net result of what happened was i accommodated this posture of bringing that left shoulder back across and so uh, what what i ended up doing is apparently just creating a compensation strategy um, so but but that that's what we're looking for with this 3ks screen is to see what sort of movement abnormalities that we see in in our patients all right so we've already looked at that once no reason to do it twice okay moving into our junctional zone structures we'll look at the posterior scapula thoracic the latissimus dorsi, and then the trapezius, <coughs> excuse me, we'll look at the upper traps, the middle, and the lower traps. So, and, and bear with me, I'm going to move forward a little bit to see if I have a video about that. And I don't think I do here. So let, let's come back up and let's talk about uh, what we have here. Uh, so in the latissimus, uh, its origin is on the spinous processes of the lower six thoracic and all of the lumbar and the sacral vertebra and the posterior uh, part of the iliac crest. It inserts into the medial lip or the crest of the lesser tubercle and the floor, sorry about that, and the floor of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Its innervation is the thoracodorsal nerve C6, 7, and 8, and its action is extension, adduction, internal rotation of the humerus. So lots of words uh, coming from um, Henry Gray, Anatomy of the Human Body from 1918. Upper trapezius, um, and actually this will apply to all of the trapezius, upper, middle, and lower. Uh, its origin is the, let me move me out of the way here, thank you. Uh, origin, the upper nuchal line, the external occipital protuberance, the medial margin of the ligamentum nuchae, and then the spinous process of C7 to T2, and the related supraspinous ligaments. Okay, so this is just the upper trapezius. The insertion is into the superior edge of the crest of the spine of the scapula, the acromion and the posterior border of the lateral third of the clavicle. So insertion is the full insertion of the entire um, uh, trapezius. Innervation here, the motor is the spinal part of the accessory nerve. Uh, sensory comes from the anterior branches of C3 and 4. Uh, the upper trap, it's a powerful elevator of the scapula. It's a rotator of the scapula during abduction of the humerus above horizontal. And the middle fibers retract the scapula, the lower fibers depress the scapula. Again, more information from uh, Henry Gray. Uh, the middle trapezius, um, let's see, uh, the upper nuchal line, external occipital protuberance, uh, still with the, uh, uh, the spinous process C7 down to T2. So here we're going to take this spinous process attachment on down uh, to about C, <clears throat> if this is C3, 4, so 5, getting closer to 6. Uh, it's insertion, again, the superior edge of the crest of the spine of the scapula, the acromion, and then the posterior border of the lateral third of the clavicle uh, anteriorly. Uh, again, same innervation, same action. And for the lower trapezius, again, it's not updated here, but that, that attachment is going to come all the way down to the spinous processes of, there is uh, T12, uh, T1, I mean L1, as far down possibly as L2. Uh, again, uh, same insertion, innervation, and action. So we break these three pieces out um, more frequently. We will draw a needle specifically into the upper trap. Uh, if it is a cervical, cervical thoracic problem, a scapula thoracic problem, we probably will then need to bring, so those fibers uh, would, would be delineated right around C7, T1. If we want to look at the middle trapezius, then we're going to drop down a little bit into this region. What's highlighted is the lower trapezius. And so depending on what, what, what dysfunction we're dealing with, may need to, to delineate all three of these sections. And we'll get to that when we ever get to the uh, dry needling component. Um, move past that. All right, so for the latissimus, we're going to roll through this and get to the video. 
And again, may want to make sure that you have your volume bumped up. And then on the online portal, everything will have normal volume. For the latissimus, the patient's going to be in the prone position. We're going to use a needle of 30 to 40 millimeters. Uh, back drop, there is none. Uh, we're going to grasp the muscle near the humerus, pulling it away from the body using the fingers to block uh, the rib cage, palpating for the thickest part of the muscle. We're going to needle posterior to anterior, medial to lateral, parallel with the rib cage, using the fingers to determine appropriate depth. So as we needle through here, you're just going to reach in, grab the bulk of that muscle tissue with your hand, and your fingers are going to curl underneath up against the rib cage uh, to, to make sure that you have a proper uh, guide to where that needle is going to go, which is going to be slightly away from the rib cage. And then as you advance the needle into the latissimus, you will be able to differentiate between um, or, or determine proper depth with the use of your hand fingers as the backdrop. Uh, when we look in depth at the advanced shoulder, uh, you'll also note that this is also uh, a good location if you're dry needling into uh, Terry's major, uh, a little bit lower into Terry's minor. Very good. All right, we'll look at the upper trapezius and we'll roll through the description in this next video. Play that. For the upper trapezius, patient again is gonna be in the prone position. Needle length here is gonna be 40 to 60 millimeters. There is no backdrop. We're going to palpate for the thickest aspect of the muscle belly. Uh, we're going to grasp the muscle between the thumb posteriorly and the fingers anteriorly, at least one thumb breadth above the supraclavicular margin to avoid the apex of the lung. We're going to insert the needle into the muscle in a posterior to anterior trajectory using the fingers opposite the insertion point as a guide to determine needle depth. Good for the upper trap. So we're taking a posterior to anterior approach. Um, as, as this needle advances, it's gonna be from the posterior aspect, we're gonna go from inferior on the posterior side, <coughs> excuse me, as it, <coughs> excuse me, as it passes through the upper trapezius, then we're gonna angle that a little bit superior on the anterior aspect. And quite honestly, just to make sure that we clear uh, any of the, the lung field as it's sitting uh, uh, close to the, that first rib. Dry needling of the trapezius is, can be an extremely effective um, uh, location for uh, muscle tension. Uh, anybody that's dealing with headaches, uh, with some of this, this cervical thing that we did, uh, that we talked about in the advanced cervical piece, uh, the upper trap, it can be a really nice uh, um, treatment for that. Uh, we, we frequently find because we carry so much neuromuscular tension in the upper trapezius that it does at times tend to be a little bit more, have a little bit more discomfort when passing the needle through that tissue. Um, you might want to advise your patient of that, uh, but uh, most people get a really good uh, improvement with their symptoms uh, after dry needling there. All right. And then for the middle trapezius, again, all of this is done in the prone position. Get that 
started right there. For the middle trapezius, uh, patient again in the prone position, needle length is gonna be about three centimeters. There's no backdrop on this, this needle. We're gonna use a pincher or a lumbrical grip medially and slightly superior to the root of the spine of the scapula to bunch up the fibers of the middle trapezius. We're gonna needle from superior to inferior through the bulk of the muscle using your fingers or your thumb as a backdrop. And the needle is we're going to run across the the the, uh, the rib cage so that we don't uh, move into that. We're just going to bunch that tissue together, kind of bulk it up, and then just going to slide that needle through or thread it through that middle trapezius. Get back to that there. All right. In this case, I would probably choose to, to hold on to that tissue because of the location of the, 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 the terminal end or the point of the needle. Um, I'm, I can't guarantee that the, per, the, the patient, the subject, won't do some movement because it's laying basically across the rib cage. Uh, I don't want to run the potential of that needle uh, being moved into that lung field. So probably in this case, I would probably uh, do some quick point stimulation and then go ahead and retrieve that needle uh, out. And then finally moving into the lower trapezius. Let's see if I can come back just a little bit here. So for uh, the lower trapezius, so for middle trapezius, we came uh, right um, above the root of the, sky, of, the, of the spine to get into the middle fibers. For the lower fibers, we're gonna take uh, a line between the spine of the scapula and the inferior angle and at a midpoint. And then we're going to reach in. Similarly, we're going to grasp that, that muscle tissue, bunch it up, and then th thread through that. For the lower trapezius, a patient again is going to be in the prone position. Needle length is about three centimeters. There is no bike drop. We're going to use a pincher or a lumbrical grip midway between the root of the spine of the, uh, of the scapula and the inferior angle to bunch up the fibers of the lower trapezius. We're going to needle from superior to inferior directly into the muscle or lateral to medial threading through the bulk of the muscle using your fingers or the thumb as a backdrop. Here, let me back up just a little bit here. So here I'm just going to palpate the spine of the scapula, the inferior angle, find that midpoint, bunch those tissues up of the lower trapezius, and then advance the needle threading through that using my fingers as my, my backdrop to, to, to guarantee that uh, my needle is not moving and in, oriented into uh, the lung field. So there we have upper, middle, lower trapezius. Okay. So moving into the junctional zone structures of levator scap, rhomboid major and minor, serratus posterior superior, and the serratus anterior. Now I'm going to look here one more time. One thing that I missed, bear with me, is 
all right, my surface anatomy. So I'm going to stop my share here for just a second, if you'll indulge me, because I'd like to bring up the 3D anatomy piece, but let me, let me open this. Sometimes my program is fast and sometimes it is slow. Let's hope we can get there quickly. All right. Let me get through here. And actually, let me come back to you and I'm going to share my screen. And actually, I fibbed. So I think we all from time to time have Mondays and I'm definitely having a Monday. All right, let me bring this back up now. All right, um, I will make sure I should be sharing fine muted. Okay, good. Okay, so let me open up, let me minimize this. All right, into my library. I'm gonna do some filtering and apologize, but I wanna get this right. Okay, so let's look at, uh, where are we? How are we looking here? All right, let's come out now. Again, one more piece of work here. Let me share both. Okay, it's going to have a hard time doing both, apparently. Okay, it's going to have a hard time doing both. So we're just going to look, look at all of these structures. So we've just gone through uh, looking at 3D anatomy. Uh, we've just gone through uh, the trapezius. So I'm going to hide that. All right. So let's move over. We're going to talk about uh, levator. So the levator scap, levator scapulae, uh, its origin, the transverse processes of C1 and 2. Get over there. And then the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C3 and 4. Um, we had some similar, the scalenes had some similar attachment sites. Uh, but we do tend to have a lot of patients with complaints of pain in this area right here. And as we looked at my 3KS uh, movement kinetic screen, uh, that was the location of my discomfort. Clinically, we find that if we ignore the levator scap, then we're going to miss out on a, on a really important structure for improving cervical motion, decreasing pain. So um, let's look at its... Uh, Insertion, superior angle of the scapula, and then the medial border of the scapula, superior to the spine of the scapula. Its action is elevation and downward rotating uh, the, the shoulder girdle. Uh, it's innervated by the anterior rami of the third and fourth cervical nerves. Okay, so I'm going to hide that, get that out of the way. Uh, let's look at, just, just in order here, uh, the rhomboids. So here, rhomboid minor. Uh, its origin is the nuchal ligament, the spinous processes of C7. Matter of fact, let me get rid of that trap as well. All right. So C7 uh, to T1 vertebra. So it's, its origin right here. And then its insertion is into the medial border of the scapula adjacent to the spine of the scapula. So we'll drop uh, distally and look at... Uh, uh, rhomboid major. Here, the sp it's the origin spinous process of T2 all the way to T5. So we have uh, minor from C1, uh, T2, and then uh, T2 down to C5 for 
uh, major uh, for major. Uh, its insertion is the medial border of the scapula inferior to the spine of the scapula. So that tells us if we want to affect a change into its insertion, which is what we're going to do, then we're going to use the spine of the scapula as our landmark. And as we needle this, we're going to needle um, into this tissue right here. Alternatively, we could try to needle uh, towards the spine, uh, spinous process in this area. And truly, if we really want to make sure we get good penetration into it, we can always needle uh, one finger breadth lateral to the spinous process into uh, the, the muscle here, anywhere from C7 down to T5. Okay, so let's hide that and, and that as well. And since we're in the area, uh, we've already talked about latissimus and its structure and its anatomy. Uh, let's look up a little bit higher at serratus posterior superior. Its origin is the nuchal ligament, the spinous process of C7 down to T3. So it shares a similar footprint uh, to um, rhomboid minor and then some of uh, the superior aspect of rhomboid major as far as its origin. Its insertion is to the external surface of the second to the fifth ribs. So um, <clears throat> it's basically is, is attaching the spinous process of these regions over to the ribs. Action, it elevates the ribs at their cost over vertebral joint. Uh, how often is this muscle uh, involved with significant pathology? Uh, that's, that's debatable. Um, however, if we're dealing with pain in this area, it's important for us to know that if we, from C7 on down um, to T3, we'll be needling through serratus posterior superior. Okay, let's go ahead and hide that. And let's, I'm going to switch my share here again. Back to this. There we go. All right, that's a little bit better. All right. Now I'm going to move over, see if I do this correctly. And if my um, counterpart will let me know if I've switched back to the, the PowerPoint uh, for the presentation, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to assume yes, and I can take, get it, take a message if no. So we just looked at our 3D anatomy of the levator scap, rhomboids, uh, serratus posterior, posterior superior. Now let's move down and look at serratus uh, anterior. So let me move back and close that. And the technical difficulties. All right. So serratus anterior. Its origin is the external surfaces of the first to the ninth ribs. So at present, I'm going to hide, actually, let me fade pec major. Okay, so we have um, serratus anterior. Boy, that's going to do better if I just get rid of it. So let's delete it. All right. So we look at uh, serratus anterior. Uh, again, the first rib up top all the way to the ninth. It inserts onto the medial border of the scapula. And so here we see it on the anterior surface. Uh, we also, it's, it's removed here, uh, shares a similar attachment to, if you'll remember, subscap as it comes over and attaches onto the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Um, so it's, uh, its action is it protracts and upwardly rotates the pectoral of the shoulder girdle at the AC and the SC joints. Uh, innervation here, long thoracic nerve C5, 6, and 7. All right, so let's hide that. And now I'm going to, again, move back here. All right. All right, let's jump there. A 
One more time. Okay. So we've talked about the, the, the anatomy of these muscles. Let's move into our junctional zones. Uh, our surface anatomy, uh, we've, we've, we've basically in the thoracic spine, we've already covered our, our uh, surface anatomy for the scapula and the posterior aspect uh, in the, the introductory lectures. Uh, so let's move into the treatment piece. As we move a little bit here, I'll pause right there. I guess I'm gonna move here instead. I'll pause once we start playing. Again, volume is going to be a little decreased. Uh, it'll be improved on the next, uh, on the student portal. So here, let me pause and go back. So patient's hand is going to be behind their back. We're going to use a pincer grip, grasp the musculature at the superior angle of the scapula. And we're going to needle through the attachment onto that superior angle from an inferior medial to a superior lateral direction along the plane of the rib cage uh, using our fingers as a backdrop. All right. So let's continue here. For the levator scapula, scapulae, the patient is in the prone position, hand behind back. Um, knee length is about three centimeters. There is no backdrop. With the patient's behind, hand behind the back, we're going to use that pincher grip uh, to grasp the musculature at the superior angle of the scapula. <coughs> we're going to needle through the attachment onto the scapula from an inferior medial to a superior lateral direction along the plane of the rib cage, using your fingers as a backdrop. Okay, so very similar um, needle placement as to uh, the upper trap. Uh, the biggest issue is we, we have to make sure uh, that we grasp onto uh, that superior border of the scapula because that is where levator is. It's making its direction uh, between, from, from that um, superior angle all the way to, again, the transverse process um, uh, as high as C2. And so we'll, we'll needle inferior medial to sup in posterior inferior medially to superior anterior lateral. So just the, the same angle there of the guide tube. Yeah, my fingers are the backdrop. You can clinically uh, the levator scap gives us lots of improvement in, in symptom relief. Okay, moving into the rhomboid major. We'll move into the, the video segment and pause and talk about that briefly. Pause here. So here we're going to use a profundus grip uh, here on rhomboid major. Um, we're going to pull the medial border of the scapula away from the chest wall and we'll needle um, to the medial border, not, not anterior to the scapula. Um, if you do move anterior, you're still going to catch rhomboid major, but we want to hit right along that, that surface right there. It's, it's very thin and so it takes a little experience uh, and repetition to, to consistently hit uh, that, that piece. Um, we will be distal to the root of the scapula. Uh, we can do a little periosteal pecking along that way. Uh, to achieve this a little bit easier, want to go into the hammer locker hand behind back position. For the rhomboid major, patient again is going to be in the prone position. We'll end up with the hand behind the back. Needle length is going to be three centimeters and the backdrop is going to be the medial border of the scapula. So with the patient's hand behind their back, we'll use a profundus grip to pull the medial border of the scapula away from the chest wall and we're going to needle to the medial border, not anterior to the scapula, distal to the root of the scapula with periosteal pecking if necessary.
And so here we, we locate that medial border and we can use that profundus grip to, to, to isolate our, our target location, which is gonna be distal to the, um, the, the spine of the scapula. And then our goal is just to, to land right, go right through um, rhomboid major onto the medial border of the spine of the scapula. All right. So we'll move on to rhomboid minor. Let me back up a little bit. Okay, so here, again, the hammer lock or the hand behind the back position, uh, we're going to, again, use that same approach. Our biggest difference is our location. Uh, we're going to be uh, at the root of the scapula um, in order to uh, target rhomboid minor. For the rhomboid minor, the patient, again, is in the prone position with the hand behind the back, a three-centimeter needle uh, with the medial border of the scapula as our backdrop. With the patient's hand behind their back, we're going to use a profundus grip again to pull the medial border of the scapula away from the chest wall. And we're going to needle to the medial border, not anterior to the scapula, at the root of the scapula with periosteal pecking if necessary. Again, same, same approach as with rhomboid major. We're just going to go to the root of the spine of the scapula to target uh, rhomboid minor. All right. Here we'll look at serratus posterior um, superior. And yeah, let me see if I can go back to that. Okay. So here we're going to identify the spinous process of C2 down to T3. We're going to needle from lateral to medial, slightly caudal, two finger breadths lateral from the spinous process. And needle length here is going to be two centimeters. It's very, it's superficial. There's no backdrop. Um, normally we do one finger breadth, and we could do one finger breadth, but we come over two, and we'll get into the bulk of the, the meat of the muscle itself. Again, we want to stay angled medially, inferiorly, uh, to make sure that we do uh, hit our target tissue without uh, entering the lung field. And again, it's superficial. For the serratus posterior superior, the patient again is going to be in the prone position. Needle length is only going to be about two centimeters. Uh, there is no backdrop here. We're going to palpate and identify the spinous processes of C7 to T3. We're going to needle from lateral to medial, slightly caudal, two finger breaths lateral from the spinous process. This is a superficial muscle and there is no backdrop. And identify our spinous processes, two finger breaths lateral. We're going to needle medial and inferior or caudal uh, with two centimeters. So we'll leave a significant portion of that shaft of that needle exposed. Okay, and then serratus anterior. So here we will see, let me come back. Uh, for serratus anterior, uh, two locations, uh, on posterior and then onto the rib cage itself. Uh, for the posterior aspect, uh, again, the patient will be in the prone position. Using a profundus grip, we're going to pull the medial border of the scapula away uh, from the chest wall and needle to the anterior surface of the scapula. Here we actually will be uh, the hand behind the back, the, the hammerlock position to get there. Alternatively, um, it can also be needled directly onto the lateral ribs at the origin of the muscle. And in, in all bold letters or all caps, do not attempt if you cannot palpate the borders of the ribs and needle only one centimeter. 
So this definitely I wouldn't recommend until uh, lots of experience, lots of practice. Uh, again, our enemy is pneumothorax kneeling into that lung field. Uh, a thin uh, body type uh, should be much easier to palpate onto the rib, which is where uh, that needle placement would go. However, I caution against doing that until you get much more comfortable with appropriate needle depth. Again, here, uh, if you, you can use uh, a longer needle, but you only want to advance it one centimeter. For the serratus anterior, position is going to be prone. We're going to have a needle length of about three centimeters. Uh, it could be a little bit more on, on this approach. Uh, the backdrop is going to be the anterior surface of the scapula. For the patient's hand behind their back, we're going to use a profundus grip to pull the medial border of the scapula away from the chest wall and needle to, needle, needle to the anterior surface of the scapula with periosteal pegging if necessary. Alternatively, serratus anterior can also be needled directly onto the lateral ribs uh, from four to nine at the origin of the muscle. Do not attempt that if you cannot palpate the borders of the ribs and needle only one centimeter. And so we'll just pull that, that scapula away from the body, uh, make it easier to gain access to the anterior surface of the scapula and you should be able to advance it uh, away from the, the rib cage and land on the anterior surface of the scapula. And then the alternative position uh, in sideline. Again, we can palpate uh, from rib one down to rib nine, obviously not as high as one, but down further onto the ribs itself. Here I'm using a three centimeter needle. I've found uh, the bed of the rib uh, or the actual rib itself. Um, I've found that the depth here was a little over a centimeter. Uh, I've needled this uh, extensively. So if, if I'm a, a new dry needler coming out, I probably try for a one and a half centimeter needle, uh, two at most, and then try to make sure that I do not needle that if I'm not absolutely positive of my rib location. <clears throat> okay, uh, moving on to our spinal structures. Here we'll look at the multifidus, the rotatories, the spinalis, longissimus, iliocostalis, and the thoracic interspinalis. Okay, so we'll look at, and I'm going to go ahead and move down to see if I I uh, included the 3D approach or if my thought today was to do this live, which it was. So let's take a moment and change my share here uh, over to complete anatomy. Again, all of the 3D anatomy pro uh, images that, that I use are, are from the Excelsior uh, uh, company uh, with their complete anatomy uh, platform. Um, I really like it. It's, uh, it's user friendly. Uh, there are lots of them out there. Use whichever one that you want. I do highly recommend using the 3D anatomy um, application uh, for learning um, more uh, anatomy for dry needling. So again, let's, let's start with the iliocostalis. Here is the lumborum piece that we looked at uh, previously. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. I think I can hide that without getting rid of the rest? Yes. So in the thoracic spine, we have the iliocostalis thoracis. And so here we can see uh, our origin is the angle of the seven to the 12th ribs. And so it's you've got this attachment uh, anteriorly. And so it's, it's uh, insertion is the angles of the first to the sixth ribs. So here are our insertions and our origins a little distally. Um, it's uh, action is extends and laterally flexes the trunk. Uh, it's innervated by the lateral branches of the posterior rami of the thoracic nerves. So we see it comes all the way uh, to um, the first 
rib. Now we're going to, let me fade that. And then let's look at the next muscle here. Um, the iliocostalis coli or services. I prefer services, uh, but, you know, call it what you want. Uh, this muscle, its origin is the angles of the third to the sixth ribs, and its insertion is the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C4, 5, and 6. So again, advanced cervical, we had looked at our, uh, move that back, um, our, our scalenes on the, uh, the lateral aspect of the neck on the articular pillar. Uh, and so that is the uh, attachment side there. I will fade that and look one more here at, oh, uh, let's see here. Well, I may have to get rid of it. All right. I'm going to hide that and hide that. Okay. So let's look back at the longissimus. Uh, longissimus thoracis. I like to differentiate the lumborum from thoracic, but um, I didn't get the name of the thing. So its origin spinous process is of L1 through L5 and the dorsal, sur dorsal surface of the sacrum and the iliac crest and inserts in the transverse process of the lumbar and thoracic vertebra and the second to 12th ribs. Here again, similar action extends laterally flexes the trunk. So we see it also terminates onto that first rib. Okay, so we hide the longissimus thoracis that brings us to longissimus coli or longissimus cervices. Here we're going to see another movement of muscle over to this lateral articular pillar in the neck. And so uh, this, again, very difficult to needle this in this area without a uh, real potential hazard into uh, the cervical, I mean, the, the thoracic and then the lung field. Uh, but here the, uh, or, the origin transverse process of T1 through T6, and then it inserts into the posterior tubercles of transverse process of C2 through C6. It's action extending laterally flexing the neck, the cervical vertebral joints. We'll hide that. We've got one more. And this is the longissimus capitis. And so very similar path except onto the cervical spine. It is now going to come onto the skull itself. So its origin transverse process of C4 down to T4. And that that's that's with its uh, other, I'm going to say partners, but it, it comes down a little bit lower. Uh, so C4 to T4, it inserts into the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So there's a there's some dry needling that we do in that area. I still prefer to try to catch that on the lateral articular pillar. Uh, just a nice location to catch a whole lot of good stuff right there. And so let's get rid of that. Okay, multifidus and rotatories, well, spinalis. So here is uh, spinalis thoracis. We also have uh, spinalis services, which is notably absent. Uh, but since we talked about it in the, in the cervical piece, uh, we'll just focus on the thoracic here. Uh, so its origin, the spinous process of T11 all the way to L3, and then it inserts into the spinous process of T2 through T8. Again, action extending, laterally flexing the trunk. How do we dry needle into this structure? Very similar, one finger breadth lateral from the superior aspect of the spinous process, uh, anywhere in the thoracic spine, and then angled medially, inferiorly, uh, like we're needling towards multifidus. And so since we speak of that devil again, here we are with multifidus, again, our primary muscle, uh, a spinal stabilizer from um, posterior superior iliac spine, dorsal surface of the sacrum, and then the mammillary processes of the lumbar vertebra, transverse process, thoracic, and then articular process of C4 through seven. Insertion is into the spinous processes of the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical vertebra. So we 
hide that, and that brings us to our, our rotatories. So we have long and short. Our long rotatories uh, origin is the transverse process of the thoracic vertebra, and then they insert into the lamina and spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra, two vertebral segments above. So we come off the transverse process, skip uh, the immediate uh, segment above to insert into um, the lamina and uh, to a certain degree, the spinous process there of uh, that segment above. Uh, the short, its origin off the transverse process again, but it's just going to come up to the lamina and spinous process, one vertebral segment, segment above. Here, their action is extending, rotating the trunk, stabilizes vertebral column. We do not have to specifically target these muscles whenever we dry needle off the superior aspect of the spinous process. Uh, at the base of the thoracic spine, we are going to, or the laminar base, we are going to needle into um, the rotatories. Uh, they are specific to the thoracic spine. And then lastly, again, similar to what we saw uh, in the lumbar spine, our interspinalis. Uh, again, superior origin, superior aspects of the spinous process, T2 down to T12, and it starts into the inferior aspects of T1 to T11, uh, and their action is extending uh, the trunk. Okay, so let's... Let's minimize that. Let's stop that share and then let's move back here. All right. Okay. So here, um, the, the treatment for the multivitus rotatories, the spinalis longissimus, iliocostalis, and the thoracic interspinalis. So the spinalis thoracis. The multivitus and the rotatories. So here we're going to use the spinous process of T7 is our target. Uh, that's going to be a nice location where we can catch all of the musculature here. Um, one finger breadth lateral, superior aspect. Um, it's going to be at the, the level of the inferior angle of the scapula. And we're going to go posterior to anterior down to the lamina. So we target uh, T7 as our place. We use that specific to uh, that landmark. It can, however, be uh, needled anywhere in the thoracic spine in that same process. For the thoracic spinalis, the rotatories and the multifidus, the patient's gonna be in the prone position. Needle length is gonna be 20 to 40 millimeters. Backdrop here is gonna be the thoracic lamina. Precautions here, the lung field, uh, the medial branch, the posterior ramus of T6 and T7, anterior ramus of T8, eighth posterior intercostal artery in the vein. Uh, we're going to palpate for the spinous process of T7 at the level of the inferior angle of the scapula. Needle placement is one finger breadth lateral from the spinous process. Angulation at 15 to 20 degrees caudal and medial. So again, we find our Inferior angle, find the spinous process. One finger breadth lateral to that superior aspect. Inferior, medial, 15 to 20 degree angulation to land down on the lamina. Okay, then let's look at the longissimus and the iliocostalis thoracis. Here we're gonna find a very, let me go back, very similar location, spinous process of T7. Um, here, we're gonna grasp that lateral border of like we did in uh, iliocostalis in the lumbar spine. We're gonna do it a little bit higher to make sure that we can now thread. Uh, as you see, uh, longissimus has now migrated a little bit more lateral. So as we dry needle into uh, the multifidus at, in the thoracic spine, uh, we no longer are going to hit longissimus. We're just going to drop into, well, through the upper trap or the lower trap. Um, in this level, a little, maybe we might catch some lats, 
uh, but we're going to then land there. But we're going to miss longissimus. So as we do this profundus grip to uh, identify the lateral border of iliocostalis, then we will needle, uh, give or take, about a 50 to 60 degree um, medial and a 15 to 20 degree caudal angulation each plane perpendicular to the skin uh, to uh, contact, possibly contact the base of the spinous process. You definitely want it to be directed there. Whether or not you land on the spinous process uh, is, is not necessary. You just want to get through that, that muscle bulk. Interestingly, it's hard to see here, but this is basically at uh, the, the angle of the rib. And so as we come off of, of this area and move further medial, then we'll be a little bit more clear of the potential to hit the long field. We're still looking for the spinous process. So I say 50 to 60 degrees with a short needle, 30 to 40 millimeters. We want to make sure that we, uh, at a minimum, are either hitting nothing or uh, the most lateral piece would be the lamina of the thoracic vertebra. Again, I hit pause. I hit or I select uh, T7. As we go superior from there, uh, the muscle gets more lateral, gets closer to the scapula, gets away from the the angle of the rib, and and our potential for challenges with that needle uh, start to elevate the further uh, cranial we go. So seven is a nice uh, upper limit on on needling those pieces right there. Thoracic longissimus and iliocostalis. Again, the patient's going to be in the prone position. Needle length will be about 30 millimeters. There is no backdrop. We're going to grasp the lateral border of the rector spinae group with a profundus grip. We're going to apply firm pressure, splay the index and middle finger. We're going to needle three to four finger breaths lateral to the spinous process of T7 with a 50 to 60 degree medial and a 15 to 20 degree caudal angulation in each plane perpendicular to the skin surface or relative orientation of the vertebral lamina with no backdrop. For the sake of safety, um, the, the more shallow that you make this, the better. Uh, as, as you get more skilled with, uh, with the application, uh, it does get a little bit more possibly therapeutic in iliocostalis longissimus uh, as you angle towards uh, the spinous process or the, the more anterior aspect uh, of the spinous process approaching uh, the lamina itself. Um, so, all right. Let's move on to the interspinalis thoracis. Uh, there's a lot more space between the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra. And so a lot easier to needle into this. Again, it's a superior uh, needle angulation. We're gonna keep a needle length at less than 20. For the interspinalis, the position is gonna be prone again. Needle length is less than 20 millimeters. Uh, there is no backdrop here. We're going to palpate to find the interspinous space between T7 and T8. When dealing uh, with the spine, this will be the only time that you will have a superior needle angulation. Uh, here it's going to be 15 to 20 degrees uh, anterior, superior, perpendicular to the skin surface. Again, caution uh, for the depth, less than 20 millimeters to avoid the spinal canal. Interspinalis, again, clinically, how often is it uh, a key player? Probably not that often. I've probably only needled it a handful of times in a clinical application. Uh, and that's usually when I've, I've gone through the other, the layers of my protocol and have not had a response, have used that and have seen some improvement, but it's not my first uh, line of defense and, and needling in the spine. Uh, if there's some lateral uh, symptoms going on, definitely I'm going to deal with the other structures before I, I go for this. Um, 
but it is it is there in the event that we're just not seeing the results that we're anticipating. Okay, so moving on to the anterior torso, here we'll look at pec major, pec minor, subclavius, and then rectus abdominis, and then the transversus abdominis, and the internal and external obliques. So here, let me come to complete anatomy. All right, so let's move anterior. And let's talk pec major, which we've um, looked at in previous a material, but uh, its origin, the anterior aspects, the medial half of the clavicle, the manubrium, and the body of the sternum, sternum, uh, and the superior six costal cartilage. Um, it inserts into the crest of the greater tubercle of the humerus. Okay, just a little bit further, we find deltoid, if you recall, latissimus comes up and attaches um, anterior to pec major. Um, clavicular fibers, and sternal fibers. There are times, so in a moment, we're gonna see, we're gonna dry needle this thing uh, right here, very similar to latissimus. We're gonna reach in, grab that muscle and needle through that, uh, that muscle fiber. Um, occasionally, we do find that we need to get um, more into the inferior or the, uh, the sternal fibers as they course this way. Um, but as a good general rule, uh, we're gonna needle right here. We move over to pec minor. So on pec minor origin, the anterior ends of the third, fourth, and fifth ribs. Uh, and then its insertion, we'll look here, is into the coracoid process of the scapula. And notably, it is on the medial surface of the coracoid. So when you're palpating your patient and looking for landmarks, uh, if there's a say a shoulder uh, problem going on, this coracoid process is going to be tender. Uh, it is uh, a challenge or, or tender to palpate uh, in, in an asymptomatic person at times. Uh, but if we want to, and we'll talk about how to needle it, uh, important to note that it's off of the medial aspect, not on the edge or the anterior piece of the acromion itself. Uh, it's action, it protracts and downwardly rotates the shoulder girdle and is innervated by the median lateral pectoral nerves. So we move into the rectus abdominis, which is absent. Um, let's move this out of the way. We need the rectus abdominis. All right, and all right, let me hide that. Okay, so let me hide that. Well, let's start. Let's start laterally with the obliques. So external oblique. Its origin. Uh, the external surfaces and inferior borders of the fifth to the twelfth ribs. So interestingly, here we have serratus anterior. And you'll notice a very close similarity to uh, where serratus anterior ends and the external abdominal oblique ends. It inserts into the anterior superior iliac spine uh, down the inguinal ligament um, into the pubic crest, uh, the pubic tubercle, tubercle, and then ultimately into the linea alba. Okay, we look at our internal oblique. Here our origin is the thoracolumbar fascia, which for some reason is, is, is hidden. Anyway, the thoracolumbar fascia that sits in this area. Um, also the, the iliac crest and the inguinal ligament. Okay, so right, this entire crest uh, at the ilium. Uh, it inserts into the inferior margins of the 10th to the 12th ribs, the adjacent costal cartilage, the, the linea alba, and the pectin pubis. So we have both of these structures um, terminating into the linea alba, which we will uh, talk about uh, just a little bit later. I'm going to hide that uh, to bring us to, uh, let's go ahead and do, let me do rectus abdominis next. I'm going to fade the transversus abdominis so that we see the fibers of rectus abdominis. 
Uh, yes, from time to time, we do have uh, patients uh, with abdominal midline uh, discomfort. Uh, these, these segments can actually uh, have low-grade spasm, muscle tension, neuromuscular dysfunction, uh, and so these are needleable. Um, origin, uh, the pubic crest and the pubic symphysis, and it inserts into the xiphoid process uh, the, uh, the costal cartilage of the fifth to the seventh ribs. So right along this path right here. Its action, it flexes the trunk, compresses and provides structural support to the adjacent abdominal structures. And so now let's bring transversus abdominis back. Here, I'm gonna go ahead actually and hide rectus abdominis. Okay, so um, bring that back. The transversus abdominis. The origin here is the costal cartilage of the seventh to the twelfth ribs, and the thoracolumbar fascia, the iliac crest, and the inguinal ligament. So a broad uh, origin. It's going to attach into the linea alba, the pubic crest, and the pectin pubis. So as you can see, all of these structures do a significant job on on their attachment to the linea alba. All right, and so we had uh, we have one more, the subclavius. Let's look here. So the subclavius is a little small muscle. Its origin superior surface of the costal end of the first rib, and the adjacent first costal cartilage. So we're we're just attaching just just right in this area. It inserts into the inferior surface of the middle one third of the clavicle, and its action is stabilizing the scap, uh, the, 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 sca the clavicle, and so uh, subclavius. All right, let's now come back and look here. Okay. All right, we've talked pec major. Let's move into uh, pec major, minor subclavius, and then the abdominals. We've done our 3D anatomy, so let's talk about treatment. Okay, so pec major, we mentioned we're going to grasp that muscle and uh, similar to the latissimus and going to get in there, use our fingers in the axle as a backdrop and we'll then needle through that musculature. The pectoralis major, the uh, patient is going to be in the supine position. Needle length will be from 40 to 60 millimeters based on uh, patient's habitus. Uh, backdrop, there's going to be no backdrop in this situation. Again, with the patient in the supine position, shoulder will be abducted to 90 degrees and then externally rotated. In that position, we're going to grasp the muscle with the fingers in the axilla blocking the rib cage, palpating between the thumb to locate the thickest aspect of the muscle. We're going to pull the muscle away from the rib cage and we're going to needle medial to lateral parallel with the rib cage using the fingers as a backdrop to determine appropriate depth. Caution here to avoid the lung field. So again, going to abduct to 90 degrees, externally rotate, and just you've got to get in there to identify uh, that, that uh, pectoralis muscle. And then you're just going to advance that needle away from the rib cage using your fingers as a backdrop. Okay, and then for pectoralis minor. All right, I'm going to come back to this screen. All right, so three potential potential needle locations. Um, the first uh, one at the tenoosseous junction, just medial to the coracoid process. So if you can palpate, let me move that a little bit. If you can palpate the coracoid process, you can then move lateral uh, half centimeter to that uh, coracoid process, needling uh, anterior to posterior less than two centimeters um, or up to two centimeters. Uh, the second approach, we're gonna place our fingers into the axilla and the thumb on the anterior chest wall. So very similar to pec major. The only difference is we have to get significantly further into the, the axilla uh, to, to protect. So our fingers are gonna be posterior 
to the fibers of pec minor here. So we've got to really get in there. And if for sometimes for the patient, it can be relatively uncomfortable. But here we're going to needle a tangent uh, or across that rib cage to, to enter into pec minor right here. Lastly, and absolutely do not attempt if you cannot palpate the course of ribs three, four, and five. Uh, pec minor attaches approximately two finger breadths lateral to the costochondral junction, and it can be needled directly onto the rib. Obviously, female, I would avoid this uh, on a very thin uh, body type male. Uh, this might be an approach that could be taken. My preferred approach is medial to the coracoid process. It's less discomfort for the patient, and very frequently this muscle does have a piece of, of inflammation or, or some dysfunction that's happening here at the coracoid process as well. So let's needle onto that. Uh, my second uh, tier would be if I need to needle it into uh, with my hand into the axilla. For pectoralis minor, the uh, patient again is going to be in the supine position. Needle length here is going to be two to three centimeters. Uh, backdrop is going to be none or ribs three, four, and five, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Precautions here, definitely the lung field, the brachial plexus, and the neurovascular bundle. Uh, so there are three possible needling sites. One is going to be at the tenoosseous junction, just medial to the coracoid process, needling anterior posterior for two centimeters. The second, we're gonna place our fingers into the axilla and the thumb on the anterior chest wall, pulling the pec minor up and away from the chest wall and kneeling tangentially to the chest wall into the belly of pec minor. Uh, the preposition can be uncomfortable to the patient, but it's required to ensure we're hitting the pec minor. The third one, do not attempt this if you cannot palpate the course of the ribs, three, four, and five. Uh, peg minor attaches approximately two finger breadths lateral to the costochondral junction. And it can be needled directly onto the rib about four finger breadths from the costochondral junction. Consider a midpoint between the nipple and the clavicle. Again, this is one you probably won't do unless you have a significant ability to palpate those ribs. <coughs> this is our first, first approach will actually be our second. Here we're going to get deep into the axilla to separate the fibers of pec minor away from the chest wall. We'll needle through that tissue. So here we will get pec major and pec minor simultaneously. Our first approach is off of the coracoid. So I identify that coracoid and then drop about a half centimeter medially. And then we're gonna needle anterior to posterior about two centimeters to land into that tenoosseous junction. and then subclavius. So go back on subclavius. We're gonna use a profundus grip at the inferior margin of the midpoint of the clavicle. And we're gonna needle from inferior to butt onto uh, the undersurface of the clavicle. Uh, so we're gonna find, again, midpoint on the clavicle uh, and needle from uh, the inferior aspect below the clavicle to, to, to have a backdrop there. Uh, onto the clavicle. For the subclavius, the patient again is going to be in the supine position. Needle length will be two to three centimeters at most. The backdrop here is going to be the undersurface of the clavicle. We're going to use a profundus grip at the inferior margin of the midpoint of the clavicle, and we're going to needle from inferior to butt onto the undersurface of the clavicle. So identify that midpoint, and then from the patient's head, we're going to needle inferior onto undersurface of the clavicle. Right there, four subclavius. Right, and then on to rectus abdominis. So here, um, two locations. Uh, one, um, I say two locations. Each of the muscular pieces of rectus abdominis 
can be dry needle depending on location of uh, symptom. Um, it tends to be more either distally or proximally, uh, but it can be needled anywhere in here. Uh, at the costal cartilage of the sixth and seventh ribs, um, we'll needle perpendicular through the rectus abdominis to the car costal cartilage. This is going to feel spongy. Uh, it, is, it is not bone, so you want to respect that spongy feel when you get to that. That is your depth. You don't want to uh, penetrate any further than that. Uh, on the in the other regions of the rectus, we'll needle in an oblique angle, and we'll just sense that tissue. The, the sense the tissue levels. We don't want to pass through the rectus and enter the abdominal cavity. Uh, we take that oblique angle and make certain that we uh, don't advance the needle too deep, and we're, we we guarantee that we won't uh, enter that cavity. For the rectus abdominis, the patient is obviously going to be in the supine position. Here, our needle length is going to be two to three centimeters. Uh, the abdominal contents sit just posterior to the rectus abdominis, so caution in advancing the needle beyond what the subject's body habitus will accommodate. A patient with minimal body fat will require shorter, shorter needle depth, so here the backdrop is none. And again, precautions here for the abdominal contents. Two types, two places of, of needling here. First, let's start at the costal, costal cartilage of the sixth and seventh ribs, lateral to the xiphoid process. We're going to needle perpendicular through the rectus abdominis to the costal cartilage, which will feel kind of spongy. Um, on the second needling approach, in the other regions of the rectus, the need, we'll needle in an oblique angle and we're going to, just going to sense the tissue levels. We do not want to pass through the rectus and enter the abdominal cavity. We'll move away from the xiphoid to locate the sixth, seventh costal cartilage and needle down to that till we sense that spongy feeling. And the rest of the abdominal, uh, rectus abdominis, again, you can see we're going to take a rather oblique angle into that tissue. Uh, you can actually uh, use a little point stem uh, to, to ascertain and make sure that you're into the, the target tissue. Okay, onto the transverse abdominis, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transverse abdominis. Okay, so these will all be needled in a single location. We're going to place our patient in the sideline position. We're going to use uh, a grip to, to bunch up the, the muscle tissue on the lateral aspect, and we're going to needle through that tissue. For the transverse abdominis, the external obliques and the internal obliques, we're going to needle those all as a single unit. Here your patient can either be in the supine position, I prefer the sideline position. Uh, above the ASIS, we're going to grasp the abdominal musculature with a lumbrical grip and then we're going to pull away from the body. We're going to needle in an anterior to posterior angulation using your fingers or your thumb as a backdrop. One thing you will, let me get all the way back to that. One thing you will note is I've used a towel roll uh, to open up uh, this space. Now, I could have used it even, this is, a, this is a thin model that we have. I could have used even a larger pillow uh, to, to really arch and open up, get some side bend uh, at there in the lumbar spine. Uh, so we have a little bit more uh, location uh, to, to grasp those muscles angulation using your fingers or your thumb as a backdrop. And I'm simply going to thread through that, making sure that I don't um, move too far to the midline uh, to actually enter into the abdominal cavity. Okay, moving on to the tendons and ligaments. Here we'll look at the radiate sternocostal ligaments, the costal cartilage, anterior SE joint ligament, the linea alba, and the inguinal ligament. 
So for the radiant sternocostal ligaments, uh, it's proximal attachment, the surfaces of the medial ends of the costal cartilages, and the distal attachment is onto the, st uh, the sternal surface. Um, for dry needling here, um, we'll, well, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that when we get to, I should have, make certain I'm not lying. I am not. Okay, so for our, come to it. Okay. Come on now. So here we're going to palpate along the lateral um, area of the sternum, and we're going to appreciate the bump in each of the sternocostal notches. Needling will be anterior to posterior onto the sternum, one finger breadth medial to the sternocostal bump. For the radiant sternocostal ligaments uh, position of the patient is going to be in the supine position. Knee length is going to be 1.5 centimeters. Uh, backdrop is going to be down to the sternum. Precautions here, the anterior cutaneous branch of the anterior ramus of the segmental nerves, the perforating branches of the internal thoracic artery and internal thoracic vein, as well as the lung field. We here we're going to palpate along the lateral um, um, along the lateral border of the sternum to appreciate the bump at each of the sternocostal notches. Kneeling will be in the anterior to posterior direction onto the sternum, one finger breadth medial to the sternocostal bump. Okay, then onto the costal cartilage. The costal cartilage here, the patient's going to be in the supine position. Uh, needle length is one and a half centimeters, and the backdrop is the costal cartilage, and you do not want to go deeper than that. Precautions, the anterior cutaneous branch of the anterior ramus of the segmental nerves, the perforating branches of the internal thoracic artery and the internal thoracic vein, as well as the lung field. Uh, here we're going to palpate the costochondral bump at the notch. We're going to move laterally one finger breadth where we'll bracket the costal cartilage with the fingers butted up against it. We're going to needle in an anterior or posterior direction. This structure is superficial and you do not needle through to a backdrop. The cartilage will feel spongy and do not needle through. Uh, if you cannot identify the costal cartilage, do not attempt to needle this structure. Again, the most critical piece is being able to actually palpate um, that structure. If you cannot, you need to stay away. Either way, I, here, here I'm using a 1.5 centimeter needle uh, because I was able to palpate that. I knew my depth, uh, but I certainly wouldn't come in uh, with a three, four centimeter needle and, and bury that thing. Uh, so keep your needle length um, shallow and, and make sure that you can palpate that, that structure. Then onto the anterior SC joint ligament.
look for the anterior uh, SC or sternocubicular joint ligament. Uh, patient again in the supine position, needle length being one and a half centimeters, and backdrop being none. Uh, do not needle past the posterior SC joint ligament. Precautions here, the anterior cutaneous branch of the anterior ramus of the segmental nerve, the perforating branch of the internal thoracic artery, the internal thoracic vein, the lung field, the brachiocephalic trunks, and the supraclavicular nerves. Here identified there. We'll try that. Uh, we'll palpate medially along the clavicle until you reach the drop-off at the manubrium, and we'll palpate for the inferior border. At the medial border, uh, the medial inferior border of the SC joint will needle in a superior and posterior direction of approximately 45 degrees with no backdrop. Again, no more than 1.5 centimeters. Now in clinical application, uh, you may want to dry needle this from the superior aspect, from the cranial aspect, back towards you. In this particular case, this mo lovely model is also my wife, uh, and so uh, I may have taken a little bit of liberty there. Uh, but from a superior aspect, cranial is a little bit better way to uh, maintain that personal space. So moving on to the linea alba. the linea alba. The uh, patient here is going to be supine uh, with a needle length of no more than 1.5 centimeters. There is no backdrop. Precaution here. If there is diastasis recti present, uh, proceed with extreme caution as the abdominal contents can be very superficial in those locations. For the procedure, uh, with the subject in supine, the knees bent and the feet planted, We'll lift the head toward the xiphoid uh, to assess the width of the linea alba to palpate for the diastasis recti. Uh, location of kneeling will be in midline, less than one centimeter penetration in the area of symptomatic complaint. We'll rule out uh, other sources of pain prior to needling the linea alba. Again, here using a 1.5 centimeter needle uh, to, to guarantee that I stay away from those abdominal contents. How often would I needle linea alba? Again, similar to um, subclavius, uh, similar to interspinalis. Uh, it's, it's not going to be uh, pertinent uh, in, in, in an incredible amount of time, uh, similar to dry needling into rectus abdominis. Uh, but any of these anterior midline uh, uh, symptoms that we deal with, uh, linea alba certainly could be uh, something of, of concern. Uh, again, we want to assess for a diastasis recti and make sure that we don't have a significant uh, a deviation from the norm. Uh, On to the inguinal ligament here, we're going to palpate ASIS and, and, then, and then we'll locate the origin of Go back, please. Uh, origin of sartorius as the subject lifts the leg off the table. Uh, needle length is just going to be one finger breadth medial from the sartorius along the line of the inguinal lig ligament towards the pectin pubis. For the inguinal ligament um, position here is going to be supine with a needle length of uh, 1.5 centimeters and there is no backdrop. The precautions here, uh, the anterior cutaneous uh, branch of the iliohypogastric nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the ilioinguinal nerve, uh, superficial circumflex artery and vein, and then um, given the location, uh, any of the lower abdominal contents. 
So the procedure, uh, we're going to palpate uh, the ASIS and then the origin uh, of, the, which, uh, of the sartorius as the subject lifts the leg off the table. Uh, needle location is going to be one finger breadth medial uh, from the sartorius along the line of the inguinal ligament. So with this attachment, we'll needle for inguinal ligament right in this area. All right, so let's move into our regional, our diagnosis protocols. Uh, here we're going to look at the cervical thoracic, the scapular thoracic, the thoracolumbar junctions, uh, the, the thoracic spine in general, and then thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, we could also include in this area our six scapular, our scapular dyskinesis, our snapping scapula, our winged scapula, and then Springle's shoulder. Uh, but we're going to save those for our advanced shoulder uh, lecture a little bit later. So we'll look at these uh, five uh, regional diagnosis specific protocols here. So for uh, the CT junction, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit here. Okay, yeah, so we're just going to walk through. Actually, let me back up because this is important stuff. Okay, so here uh, we're going to be in the prone position. Uh, our target structures are going to be our cervical or our thoracic erector spiny or our spinal paraspinal group, uh, and then our scapulothoracic uh, musculature. Uh, as we go through our, our regional diagnosis specific protocols, uh, we're first always going to look at our primary locations. In this case, it's going to be our upper traps and then adjacent to the spinous process of C6 and T4. Um, we established our protocol of how we're going to uh, needle these um, in our last lecture. Uh, our secondary locations would be our middle trapezius, our segmental spinous process uh, from C5 all the way down to T6. Uh, here we would include our levator scap and rhomboid minor. And then our tertiary locations here, uh, our lower traps, uh, our serratus superior, posterior, our rhomboid major, our serratus anterior, and our subscapularis. For our uh, CT junction, we usually anticipate we're going to get our biggest result out of the upper traps and then our spinous process at C6 and down to T4. And then as we need to, we can advance into these later stages. We can always dry needle into our um, our, our spinal segmental locations. Uh, we can always apply our electrical stimulation. For the cervical thoracic junction, uh, uh, patient position here uh, will be prone. Uh, target structures will be the cervical and th thoracic erect or spiny group, as well as the th scapulothoracic muscle musculature. Uh, electrical stimulation, again, 20 minutes uh, from a burst frequency of 3 up to 75 to 100 hertz. Um, initial, the primary locations here, we'll look at the upper trapezius and then those muscles adjacent to uh, the spinous process of C6 and the spinous process of T4. In needling uh, approach, we'll take one finger breadth lateral to the spinous process and needle medially and slightly inferiorly down to uh, the lamina of the vertebra. Uh, we move further into the secondary locations. So here we'll, we'll look at uh, the middle trapezius uh, segmentally at the spinous process anywhere from C5 all the way to T6. Uh, we'll talk about levator scap and then rhomboid major. Again, those secondary uh, needle uh, locations or target structures that we want uh, to, to needle. Uh, from a tertiary standpoint, our third layer, we'll look at uh, 
Uh, let me see if I can bring. Uh, it's sitting right there. Uh, the lower trapezius, um, serratus posterior, um, serratus superior posterior uh, sits uh, 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 anterior to or deep to uh, the rhomboids. Um, again, rhomboid major. Um, and then um, serratus anterior and then subscap on the anterior surface of the scapula itself. Lastly, we'll get down to some proximal spinal segmental locations. And again, anywhere from C5 all the way down um, to the mid thoracic region, uh, good uh, needling location for uh, local segmental uh, tri needling approach. So the regional diagnosis specific protocol for the cervical thoracic or the CT junction. Uh, here the patient is going to be in the prone position and our target structures are going to be the cervical and thoracic rectus spiny muscle group and the scapulothoracic muscles. So who would, who would be um, who would be the proper candidate for this uh, protocol? Well, uh, if you have a, a mid to upper cervical uh, region that didn't extend down below, uh, C7 or T1, obviously you could stay elevated. Uh, but uh, if you're going through your, your 3KS, your three-dimensional kinetic screen, uh, and you do find some of that pain has, has traveled down into the scapular region or uh, below the level of C7, uh, then, then it would be appropriate to go ahead and, and introduce uh, this uh, CT junction regional diagnosis specific protocol. Here, our primary uh, locations are going to be upper traps uh, adjacent to the spinous process of C6 and T4. That'd be those muscle groupings that we did an introductory cervical spine that will accommodate uh, all of that erector spinal group in the cervical spine. Our secondary locations would be the middle trapezius and then segmentally uh, the spinous process of anywhere from C5 down to T6. Uh, secondary, again, we had to include the levator scap, rhomboid minor, and then getting to our tertiary uh, locations would be lower trap, serratus superior, posterior, rhomboid major, um, serratus anterior, and then subscapularis. But let's look um, into uh, our upper trapezius uh, primary locations first, and I'm going to bring uh, this screen on over. Uh, so we've got uh, these two right here. And so let's pull out a tool. Um, I'm going to use a 3D pen here. Uh, so first off, we, we, we recall we want to hit, again, upper trapezius. We're just going to find that midpoint between uh, the acromion and the base of the neck. So right about here will be our, will be our target. Let me go ahead and clear that. Uh, will be about here. Then we want to be adjacent to uh, C6. So here is C7, the spinous process C7. So C6, uh, we could be one finger breadth to either side there. And then also uh, we had gone through T4, one finger breadth lateral from the spinous process of T4. And so that would be our primary uh, needle location. So we'll move out of that. Let's come back. Our secondary locations. Our middle trap uh, segmentally again from spinous process C5 down to T6, the levator scap and the rhomboid minor. You can see uh, those three locations there. And then for uh, rhomboid minor, so that would look uh, like, like this. Um, let me come up and we'll look at on the right side since that uh, area is, is dulled a little bit or faded. Uh, so again, our 3D pin, uh, we would look at levator scap. So that would be through that area. We would definitely want um, um, rhomboid minor. Uh, we'll have um, straightest anterior superior. We'll catch right off the spinous process and uh, levator scap. Oh, the middle trap. That's right. And then the, the middle trap, which we will catch um, right right in here, right around the spine of the scapula. I actually could have brought rhomboid minor up just a little bit. As you can see, serratus superior, um, inferior, I mean, serratus posterior, superior, uh, is also we're going to kneel that in line with uh, rhomboid minor. So those three uh, locations for our secondary uh, locations. 
and then we'll come down and look again at our tertiary. Here we'll have the lower trapezius, serratus superior. Well, let, let me come back. Rhomboid, levator, middle trap, not the... Uh, so it's in, and it's in our tertiary that we have the serratus superior, posterior. Uh, we can also catch um, rhomboid minor uh, in that same area at its insertion. Uh, but here, uh, the lower trapezius, which we'll catch down really low, the serratus posterior, uh, superior posterior, rhomboid major, which we'll catch right here, and then serratus anterior and subscap will we'll, we'll needle from the posterior aspect onto the anterior surface of the scapula. And so those five right in a row right there, again, being in a prone position, um, we'll be able to catch those nice and easily. Get my pin, um, the lower trap, uh, we can come up a little bit higher and catch straightest anterior subscap, um, rhomboid major, and then serratus posterior superior. So rhomboid major. Uh, so the, the needle inclination for here, we're gonna be threading through the trap. Uh, we'll, we'll need to, for rhomboid, we'll need to butt up against the medial border of the scapula uh, to get into that. Um, again, uh, with, um, the one, the needle placement for serratus anterior and subscap, it'll be similar to what we're doing for um, for the rhomboid major. Rhomboid major, if at all possible, we want to peck onto the lat this medial border periosteum. For serratus anterior and subscap, we want to move anterior into uh, the the anterior aspect of the of the scapula, and so actually, with we want needle placement to terminate right about here, but on the anterior aspect. And so that is the tertiary level uh, for um, the CT junction. Okay, so let's move on to the ST or the scapulothoracic junction. Here in the thoracic spine, you're gonna see a lot of carryover uh, between a lot of these structures. So let's uh, move into this. There we go. And I'm just gonna move on to our demonstration here. For the scapulothoracic dry needling protocol. Uh, the patient will be in the prone position. Our target structures will be the scapular stabilizers. For electrical stimulation, we can look at uh, up to 20 minutes of stem, uh, recommended burst frequency, three up to 100 hertz. Our primary structures will be the upper, middle, and lower trapezius, the rhomboid major, and the rhomboid minor. Our secondary locations will be the levator scapulae and, and the serratus anterior, and then the tertiary locations would be subscapularis and latissimus dorsi. The proximal spinal segmental locations would be C4, C5, C6, and C7. Okay, let's look at the, the, the scapulothoracic or the ST junction, uh, the dry needling protocol. This is the regional diagnosis specific protocol. Uh, patient here is going to be in the prone position, and here our target structures are scapular stabilizers. And so when would we uh, want to use the, the ST junction? Well, anytime we're dealing with any of this upper thoracic uh, laterally towards the scapular border, this is something you're going to uh, feel out as you're going through your uh, 3KS, uh, your, your dynamic movement assessment. Um, moving in the, in the shoulder, shoulder blade area, uh, should represent some sort of a dysfunction, whether it's a limitation of movement, whether it's a pain issue, we should see that there. And that would make this appropriate for this uh, treatment protocol. Uh, primary locations are going to be the trapezius and the rhomboids, secondary levator scap, serratus anterior, and then tertiary, the subscap, and latissimus. So you can see we just have a little crescent of uh, structures that we're going to needle all around uh, the um, uh, the shoulder blade itself. 
So let's, I'm going to move this out of the way and move this up. So uh, let's come down. Let's look. Uh, let me undo that. I don't need to mark on it yet. <clears throat> okay, so we'll look at the scapular border here. Okay, so the first is going to be our trapezius and our rhomboids. So let's take a look here. Let me get rid of that. Too many things happening. All right, down to my pen. So the trapezius will look at uh, the upper, upper trapezius. We'll catch the fibers of the middle trapezius, and then we'll catch them down low as well. So we'll catch the trapezius, and then we want to catch rhomboids as well. Um, so on on the upper, middle, and lower. Sorry, on the middle and lower trapezius. Uh, the needle here is going to be threaded through this musculature. So otherwise, it would be at a great location to go ahead, hit, go, to, go ahead and hit the rhomboids. Um, in this particular case, you could travel through the trapezius and into the rhomboid, both minor and major, at the same time. However, you're going to get less surface area of, of the trapezius if you're not threaded through that. So I would recommend a threading through upper, middle, lower trapezius. And then on the rhomboids, uh, minor and major, more of uh, from midline towards the scapular border itself. Again, on rhomboids, our goal is to try to tap or to peck onto uh, the medial border of the scapula, both here in the upper aspect for minor and then lower for major. So our second... Um, Location. Let me go ahead and clear those. Secondary locations are going to be the levator scap. So uh, we're going to catch uh, right here. Uh, and again, depending on preference and patient position, you can needle uh, preferably superior to inferior, although it can be inferior to superior. Um, again, patient therapist position dependent there. And then we also want to catch the serratus anterior. So here we're going to put hand behind the back. We're going to wing that medial border up a little bit. Then we can advance that needle from medial to lateral to land on the anterior surface of the scapula. And those are our secondary locations. Then we move on to, let me clear those. We'll move on to our, our tertiary location, which here we're going to look at uh, subscapularis and latissimus dorsi. Uh, so, when we came in just a momentary a moment ago for subscap uh, for serratus anterior, uh, we actually will have hit subscap there. So that's another one of the the, the two first we get. And actually, in this case, if we're coming in right above at or above the spine of the scapula, we're also going to get rhomboid minor. Uh, but for tertiary location, the plan is subscapularis, and then further laterally. Uh, Uh, we would catch the latissimus. Uh, let me go ahead and pull the pin up right on the lateral aspect as well. So that would be our tertiary uh, for um, our scapulothoracic junction pain. Okay, then for our thoracolumbar junction. protocol for dry needling uh, the thoracolumbar region. Uh, here the patient will be in the prone position. Uh, our primary locations will be multifidus, longissimus thoracis, and iliocostalis thoracis. Uh, these can all be accomplished by two uh, separate uh, needle placements um, at each spinal segment, at each segmental level. Um, in which segmental level is just determined on, on patient symptomology. We move to our secondary locations. And here we'll look at latissimus and the lower trapezius. So coming more to that TL junction 
right there uh, of the lower traps and latissimus, big broad muscles uh, that contribute to that TL junction. And then finally, moving down to our tertiary locations, and I will move to our location here. All right, so as we move, I'm going to look at two different sides. Um, our obliques, uh, internal and external obliques, and then transversus, abdominis, uh, definitely contributors to uh, issues related to TL junction. And then further, and I've, I've gone a little bit deeper here, uh, we'll look at quadratus lumborum and the psoas major. Um, one could say iliacus uh, may treat them similarly. Uh, but those are the structures identified and we would look at treating for uh, junction, uh, pain in the TL junction. Okay, so the regional protocol for the TL or the thoracolumbar junction. Uh, here, the dry needling protocol, patient is going to be in the prone position. Um, and this is going to be any of those pain patterns that you see from middle to lower thoracic spine all the way down uh, to let's say the level of the iliac crest. Uh, so uh, very frequently and when we do treat uh, quote unquote back pain, we are gonna be dealing with uh, more of a TL junction, especially if it comes up uh, into that uh, lumbar spine towards the thoracic junction. Here our primary dry needle locations are gonna be the multifidus, the longissimus and iliocostalis. Our secondary locations, we're gonna go ahead and get latissimus and the lower trapezius. And then for our tertiary locations, we'll hit transversus abdominis, uh, internal external obliques, uh, the serratus posterior superior, uh, QL, and so as major. So let's let me move this uh, out of the way. Let's bring up our our fella here. All right. So first thing we're going to look at our primary locations will be multifidus. Let me bring up my pen. Uh, 3D black, so multifidus. Let's say we wanted to catch, um, what we know here is L4, 3, 2, 1. Let's say we wanted to needle, uh, let's, let's zoom in a little bit here. So again, we know 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, the base terminal end of um, the, uh, the trapezius. Uh, let's catch our tool again. So, uh, 3D. Again, we want to catch multifidus, so we'll we'll come up. Let's come up a segment above. So one finger breadth lateral. Okay, we'll do above, and let me change that to black. That's much easier to see. Okay, we are 3D there. Wonderful. So there's multifidus at uh, T12. We'll drop down level and catch T1, we can take, the, or L1, and we can take that all the way down segmentally as we need to. For our longissimus and thoracis, longissimus will, will be needling uh, as it sits right here. We'll needle through that in the, the lumbar spine. As we get into the thoracic, it's going to veer a little bit lateral, so we'll have to make a different approach. But here, we should be getting into that. For our iliocostalis, then we're going to have to come from this lateral uh, position and here our needle will be oriented um, from medial, um, from lateral to medial, uh, fairly superficial, so we don't get too deep, but still catch all of the fibers of the iliocostalis here. So that's our primary locations. Our secondary locations, let me clear our, our business there, is gonna be the latissimus and uh, the lower trapezius, uh, lower traps, we will just simply catch those let me get my pen. Now the lower traps we can catch right here. We'll, we'll just uh, grab those with a pincher grip, uh, lumbar will get grip possibly, and then thread across uh, this direction. And then for, uh, that's a lower trap for latissimus, where we're just gonna put our hand into that bulk of the muscle in the axilla. And in about this location, we will needle uh, away from midline uh, from medial to lateral, uh, making sure that we don't uh, get into that uh, rib cage. Uh, so let's clear that. We'll get to our tertiary uh, location. And here, uh, different locations to do the transversus abdominis, the obliques. Um, uh, 
so on those, we can actually, one of the easiest ways to get those is with your patient in the sideline position. We can use a pincer grip and pulling out my pen again. Uh, we can uh, pinch those, those muscle fibers together and then in the sideline position again, we can needle, it's hard to see this in a three-dimensional um, view, three-dimensional and a two-dimensional view, but we'll needle through that, we'll thread through that tissue from a, a posterior to anterior, or if we have to be on the anterior side, anterior to posterior, uh, just making sure that it's in a tangent to uh, the body as well. We don't want to orient that needle into the uh, visceral compartment. Uh, and so we'll, there we can catch transversus abdominis, internal, external, obliques. So we move from there, we want to look at uh, the, mus the fibers of the straightest posterior inferior. And again, we can see the border of that muscle group right here. Uh, so anywhere uh, in this uh, vicinity, uh, we can needle uh, fairly superficial, probably less than uh, two, between two and three centimeters as far as the depth there. And then lastly, we can go after, uh, let me clear, give me my pen, let me clear those. So lastly, we can come after QL and so as. Um, so one of the easier ways, uh, let me hide there. I want you to show you the, the QL. So here is QL. So you can see the, the orientation of the, the fibers of QL. Um, if we take this lateral, lateral most border of iliocostalis and move further onto the, the, the iliac crest, in that window is where we can definitely have our best impact on um, QL. Now, if I hide that a little bit deeper, then we can see the fibers of psoas. So the way to have a good needle placement here is at the lateral piece of iliocostalis, just a finger breadth or so further lateral, we'll needle posterior to anterior with some decent depth to make sure that we penetrate into uh, psoas major. Uh, it can also be done from the sideline position, uh, but I, I like and I prefer to take uh, QL and psoas right here, posterior to anterior. And that would comprise our needling protocol for the thoracolumbar junction. And so on, on QL and psoas, we didn't spend a great deal of time uh, looking at that. Uh, we will look at the tail junction again in the advanced lumbar spine, which is our next lecture. Uh, and we'll, we'll discuss the different approaches for that. Okay, and then just for general thoracic uh, pain. When dry needling for uh, general thoracic pain, the protocol uh, begins patient in the prone position. Uh, our target structures are the erector spinae group, um, and then electrical stimulation can be offered up to 20 minutes, a burst frequency of three up to 100 hertz. Our initial primary locations uh, will be the thoracic uh, spinous process segmentally uh, in that we get a deep number of structures uh, all the way through down to and including the multifidus. Um, also, iliocostalis and longissimus thoracis. Uh, and so here we have uh, the longissimus and then further laterally is the iliocostalis. Um, more midline structures, um, the spinalis, we will, as we dry needle through um, lateral or adjacent to the spinous process, uh, those structures will be uh, targeted there. We further go into our, our secondary locations, and here we'll look generally at uh, the scapulothoracic protocol as well as the cervical protocols. Uh, 
Uh, don't want to exclude mo more lateral uh, and more, more proximal structures as well. And then finally, our tertiary locations would be onto the ribs themselves. Uh, extreme caution has to be taken. Uh, if, if, those, if the rib and intercostal space cannot be palpated and, and definitely identified, then you definitely want to stay away from ribs. Again, this is one of the precautions uh, to avoid uh, pneumothorax. Okay, so the dry needling protocol for the thoracic spine. Uh, who would this be appropriate for? Uh, well, let's be honest, it's anywhere that's mainly isolated between T1 and T12. Rarely do we have just a true thoracic uh, issue. Uh, if we do, odds are it's going to be um, periscapular, midscapular um, in around the T6, T7 area. Uh, but the, anybody that uh, has that discomfort without um, issues up into the cervical or down to the lumbar region would be appropriate here. Our position is going to be prone. Our target structures will be the erector spiny group. Our primary locations are going to be the thoracic um, spinous process segmentally. Um, here that's going to be uh, your multifidus. And then you move a little further laterally, we'll catch iliocostalis and longissimus. Our secondary locations will be the scapula thoracic and the cervical protocol. So those will be represented up a little bit higher. And then tertiary locations is out onto the ribs. Uh, a caution there we'll talk about uh, momentarily. Uh, let me move this out of the way. Let me get our, our specimen in place. So uh, let me remove QL there. All right, we're done. All right, so let's, let's come up a little bit here. And I'm going to go ahead and take out the um, there we go the trap so we can see what's happening here okay so first uh, the thoracic uh, here we'll, we'll look at the spinous processes and what we're looking at here is the multifidus uh, so if you recall uh, multifidus in the thoracic spine is going to sit uh, a little bit uh, more medial as uh, longissimus and iliocostalis are starting to veer a little bit to a more of a lateral approach. So multifidus will be uh, needled independently here. Yes, we will needle in through some other structures, uh, like here, rhomboids, uh, lower, we'll get into the traps, uh, serratus posterior, inferior, uh, other structures, but our target at the spinous process, one finger breath lateral would be um, our multifidus. We'll look a little bit further lateral, and then we will get into our longissimus and iliocostalis. So whereas previously we had been one finger breadth uh, lateral uh, to the spinous process, and that can be through any of the segments uh, in the thoracic spine, for the um, iliocostalis and longissimus, will be uh, a good bit more lateral, and then our needle will be much more at an oblique angle uh, coming from lateral to medial. Again, caution here is we won't, don't want to enter into uh, between the ribs, uh, so not too much of an anterior direction um, as, we're, as we're going into that muscle. It does get a lot more, uh, a lot thinner, a lot more superficial uh, than we had uh, down in the low thoracic, say, at, uh, or the, the lower lumbar, say at L1, L2. Uh, but iliocostalis longissimus there. For the, close, clear that pin. For the um, thoracic spine, most definitely, like I said, it's, it's gonna be rare to have an isolated issue there. Uh, so a secondary location may be the entire scapulothoracic um, protocol or the cervical protocol, either of those, which there is a lot of carryover between all of those. So a lot of the points in and around the medial border of the scapula into the rhomboids, uh, serratus posterior, superior, uh, and then that uh, spinous process of C6 down to T4, uh, those locations uh, will definitely more than likely play a role. Uh, but we finally get into our, our tertiary uh, position, which would be onto the ribs themselves. And an extreme word of caution, if you cannot with any consistent let me close that. If you cannot with 
with that with a hundred percent absolution know that you are on the rib then you do not need to needle that what we do not want is a needle to enter into the rib uh, into the lung field so if you can palpate 100% uh, certainty that you are on the rib then you can needle that my recommendation is uh, get lots of practice before you attempt it and then you will want to take um, and, and identify, place your finger in the intercostal space on either side of the rib. And that should uh, bring that rib space open to where you can palpate there. If necessary, you can have them side bend, uh, collapse away or open up away and collapse down to identify that. If you're going to do that, use no more than a 1.5 millimeter needle and leave at least a half a millimeter exposed. So again, very big caution on needling to that. Uh, that being said, at times we do get some good benefit there. So for our thoracic uh, pain, our, our dry needling protocol for the, the thoracic area, uh, that would be the last of our, ter our, our muscles. That's our tertiary of the rib. Okay, and then let's move into the thoracic outlet syndrome. I know we're running a little bit over. We've got this protocol, we've got a, a perineural protocol, and then we'll be finished. For the thoracic outlet syndrome dry needling protocol, our uh, patient will be in the seated or prone uh, and supine uh, position, uh, patient and clinician preference uh, in, in that position and which muscles we're dealing with. Um, our target structures are going to be the scapular movers, uh, again, electrical stem, up to 20 minutes with burst frequency 3 to 100 hertz. Our primary structures that we're going to look at will be initially uh, pectoralis minor, biceps brachii short head, and coracobrachialis. Second, we will look at the serratus anterior and the upper trapezius. Uh, in this side, uh, remove the upper trapezius uh, from the image. Um, and this can be done uh, depending on, on access. Uh, serratus anterior can be needled um, uh, below the axilla on the ribs themselves. Uh, if they can be, those structures can be palpable. And then upper traps, obviously, uh, up, um, right through here. Uh, serratus anterior can also be needled uh, in the prone position um, on the anterior surface of the scapula. And then our, our tertiary locations would be rhomboid major and minor, and then levator scapulae. Uh, and then our, our spinal segmental locations would be everything from C5 down to T1. For thoracic outlet, the dry needling protocol uh, position here is going to be seated, can be prone or supine. Seated is probably the easiest. Target structures here are the scapular movers. So who's appropriate here? Um, this is going to be anybody with a postural issue, rounded shoulders, forward head, anybody that's having some radicular, some radiating uh, symptoms uh, out laterally past the acromion, especially if it's uh, past distal to the elbow. Um, any, anyone that you suspect may have some impingement, uh, the brachial plexus, as it's coursing through that uh, brachial pathway. Our primary dry needling locations will be the pec minor, the short head of the bicep, and the coracobrachialis. The second will be the serratus anterior and the upper traps, and then our tertiary will be the rhomboids and the levator scap. Uh, we can also look at some uh, proximal spinal segmental locations uh, from C5 all the way down to T1. So let's move from here and take a look at uh, on our, uh, our model. So our primary locations we said would be, let me bring up my pen, uh, primary would be uh, the pec minor, the short head of the bicep, and the coracobrachialis. So pec minor, uh, in different ways that we can get to that, uh, we can take a direct 
let me close and let me come in a little bit tighter here. So we can needle the uh, pec minor uh, just medial to the coracoid. So the coracoid is sitting right here. And so we can needle it medial to that and slightly inferior. So we could needle there. Now you want to be cautious because of, again, the brachial plexus sitting further distal. So you definitely don't want to drop a, a six centimeter needle into that to, to get to that. Uh, we can also look on our primary location, the short head of the bicep and the coracobrachialis. So they will both sit right here. So a couple that we can catch just right there. If we wanted to, short head, we could catch it further down into the, the bicep itself or on the, let me close that out, on the peg major, I'm sorry, the peg minor, if we wanted to take that uh, hand in the axilla approach and then thread uh, across, uh, let me bring out my, my pen, let me clear those. Uh, we also have the choice with peg minor to needle across those fibers uh, that can be done there as well um, so let me clear that we'll close our secondary location would be the serratus anterior and the upper trapezius uh, for serratus anterior again we will take um, a position on the posterior aspect we'll have them put hand behind back and our needling will be from a midline to a lateral position will go anterior to the lateral border of the scapula. So we're going to end up, uh, our backdrop will be the anterior surface of the scapula um, instead of posterior. And then upper traps we can hit, um, most common we'll hit it in a single location. Uh, there's a trigger point a little bit more proximally, a little bit more distally. You can use multiple needles in there if you want, uh, but uh, upper trap, serratus, um, anterior. Um, on the serratus, if a person is so inclined, they can also come. Um, obviously, the arm has to be elevated out of the way. Uh, if, it, if it can be palpated, uh, they can also be needled uh, on the rib cage itself. But usually catching on the poster aspect uh, is more advantageous. And then finally, our tertiary locations, our rhomboids and our levator scap. Um, again, these are all muscles that are controlling uh, scapular uh, movement, depression, elevation, uh, so we can catch uh, levator, rhomboid, minor, and major. Again, these will be butting up against the medial border of the scapula, and then uh, levator is going to be threading across that muscle. And so those are the dry needling locations for thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, and then finally, uh, in the thoracic spine, just single perineural protocol for the supraclavicular nerves. dry needling for the uh, supraclavicular nerves. The supraclavicular nerves are three groups of nerves that arise from C3, C4 nerves via the cervical plexus and they provide sensory innervation of the skin above and below the clavicle. Once they pass through the platysma, the fibers arrange into medial, intermediate, and lateral. It also innervates part of the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, dry needling position will be seated. Uh, we can do either bidirectional or unidirectional rotation uh, for needle manipulation. And electrical stimulation up to 20 minutes with a burst frequency of 2 to 3 up to 100, 100 hertz. Our primary uh, neural locations, uh, first in the lateral third of the upper trapezius, then inferior to the clavicle in the anterior deltoid, and inferior to the clavicle and the clavicular portion of pectoralis major. Needle length here will be one and a half centimeters. For our secondary muscular locations, we'll draw a needle into splenia cervicis and splenius capitis uh, with a needle length there of three centimeters. And then finally, our proximal spinal segmental locations will be C3 and C4. 
for the perineural protocol for the supraclavicular nerves. Uh, here, um, they, the, so the, the supraclavicular nerves, uh, three groups of nerves that arise from C3-4 and uh, via the cervical plexus, and they provide sensory innervation of the skin above and below the clavicle. Once they pass through the platysma, the fibers arrange into the medial, intermedial, intermediate, and then lateral. It also innervates parts of the sternoclavicular joint for a treatment patient will be in the seated position. We can do some needle manipulation if we so choose. Um, and let's let's let me move that and bring our model up so that we can talk about the procedure. All right. So the supraclavicular nerve. First off, we're going to see that it is um, traveling out uh, again between C3 and C4. And these are the nerve uh, bundles as, as they come out onto the upper trapezius. And you see, and that's the more of the posterior fibers, uh, the lateral uh, coming up more onto the anterior delt. And then on uh, the, 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 the last branch down onto the pec uh, major itself. So for dry needling here, um, you know, if so, if a person does have some some sensory uh, changes in the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, uh, upper pectoral uh, region, uh, supraclavicular perineural protocol may be appropriate here. So our primary neural locations uh, first is going to be bring up my pen uh, in the lateral third of the upper trapezius. So as this muscle, uh, as this nerve moves lateral uh, from the uh, platysma onto uh, the upper trap, uh, we can needle out into this area. Um, we can do one, we can do multiple needles if we so choose along this uh, area. Again, we want to keep in mind uh, the location of the lung field and make sure that we stay superior to that. So any needle angulation would have to be respectful of that lung field. So uh, additionally, we would also look at, let me close that and do a little rotation. Uh, we would also want to look at, bring that in, grab my pen, uh, inferior to the clavicle in the anterior deltoid. So we see that this uh, branch of the nerve uh, crosses over the, uh, the clavicle uh, at the lateral half, lateral third, and so we would want to drop a uh, needle here and then just a uh, little bit medial to uh, the AC joint, uh, drop a needle um, distal to or inferior to the, the clavicle there as well. And then finally, we would drop another needle into the medial half of the clavicle into uh, the fibers of the pec major, anywhere in this general vicinity. Again, we want to keep in mind the orientation of the needle and the, the, the penetration depth. Uh, these would be very superficial. Uh, you might use a 1.5 centimeter needle with uh, leaving probably half a centimeter exposed. Um, that way you can re respect the, uh, the lung field posteriorly. So here are primary neural dry needling locations. Um, lateral third of the upper trap into the anterior delt and into the uh, clavicular fibers of the um, peg major. So we'll clear that. Okay. Secondary, uh, our, our muscular locations. Oh, let me clear and close. All right, our secondary. So we're, we want to look at uh, where this uh, nerve exits. And so the easiest thing for us to do is come in into our splenius services, splenius capitis, and we can drop our needle here, this will be a little bit more anterior um, of a needle placement. But here we can catch these in, in this area. And again, that nerve is going to bisect those muscles and a potential area for entrapment. Um, oh, let me undo that. Well, actually, let me close and then come around. This could also be needled at the spinous process of, say it with me, C6 and T4. And that would get that neuromuscular re release that we're looking for in those structures. 
And then finally, we could also just come up segmentally into uh, C3, C4. So we know C2 is going to, or C1 is going to sit right here, C2 right below it. And so C3 and C4 being the, the, the segments of the supraclavicular nerve innervation. And so that is the perineural protocol for the supraclavicular nerves. All right, so we've gotten through that. I do apologize. It is 8.30, so that was two and a half hours. There's just a lot of content to cover. Uh, so we've completed that part of the lecture. Our post-lecture assignment, very simply similar, similar to last time, I want you to submit a sample 3KS video that includes uh, the cervical linear, linear motion, the cervical diagonal rotation, the trunk rotation, the lumbar linear motion, and then the lumbar diagonal rotation. And then just submit a brief description of what your analysis is of the motion uh, that you submit. Up next, we're gonna look at the advanced lumbar spine and the SI joint, if I remember correctly. That is two weeks from today. If it is not, we will make sure we get that email out uh, and to let you know what's happening. So thanks for uh, sticking uh, with me so long to tonight, and we will see you for our next lecture on lumbar and SI.